uh, pronouns because pronouns tend to lose the meaning. So instead of using the pronoun, we use the actual name or instead of referring to some action, we repeat the action. This pounds in the idea. That, and that's what that's all about. We're pounding in, this is what happened over and over again. So that, that's the reason for that style. Hopefully you're learning a little bit about how to write. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> discussion and conclusions of law. I think we're, we're approaching the big laugh here. <clears throat> On October 7th, William Jones filed an action of trespass for damages. The opening sentence decreed, this is a court of record. In defendant's demur and later his answer, there was no objection to the court being a court of record. Nowhere in the record is there any objection from magistrate or defendants regarding this court being a court of record. On May 5th, 1999, this court determined that William Jones is one of the people as contemplated in the preambles of the constitutions. This court is a court of record, and all parties were properly so apprised. Building on that, the court issued a show cause writ of error. Throughout the writ, the concept of a court of record was asserted. The magistrate, plaintiff, and defendants were each invited to file and serve on all other interested parties a brief no later than June 7th to show cause why this order should not take effect or should be modified. No objections or briefs were served or filed. The magistrate and parties, by their lack of action and lack of objection, tacitly accepted the writ and its supporting papers. And I'll tell you something else. 100% of all the orders to show cause I've ever issued have gone unanswered. It's an interesting little thing. If you fail to object, it means you agree, right? right? That applies to the other side too. It is the design of our systems of jurisprudence that courts have no jurisdiction until a party comes forth and declares a cause needing resolution. Yeah, judges have no authority until somebody files a lawsuit. That's what we're saying. The particular jurisdiction depends on how the cause is declared by the plaintiff. Jurisdiction may be administrative, at law, in equity, or any of many other formats. In this case, the jurisdiction is at law in a court of record under the sovereign authority of one of the people. It is essential to understand what are a sovereign, a magistrate, a court, and a court of record. A court is the person in suit of the sovereign. Who is the sovereign? It is the people, either in plural or in singular capacity. In singular capacity, in this case, it is William Jones, one of the people as contemplated in the preambles of the 1849 Constitution for California, the 1879 Constitution for the state of California. You notice that there's a difference between California and the state of California. And the, and the 1789 Constitution for the United States of America. Notice it's not of the United States of America. <coughs> because that's exactly what it says in those preambles. California, the state of California, and the United States of America have no general sovereignty. Theirs is eclipse sovereignty. Whatever sovereignty they have is limited to their respective constitutionally defined spheres of control. The general sovereignty is reserved to the people without diminishment. Lest that be forgotten, the California government code twice admonishes the public servants that the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Further, when the state of California did attempt to diminish one's rights, it was determined that the state cannot diminish rights of the people. That was the Hurtado case. Okay? It is by the prerogative of the sovereign whether and how a court is authorized to proceed. In this case, the chosen form of the court is that of a court of record. This court recognizes the good work of the legislative and judicial branches of the United States of America and has adopted the federal rules of civil procedure as its own rules. This is compatible with the choice of the California legislature which expresses its will through the California Code of Civil Procedure, section 1897, which states in part, quote, the written law of this state is therefore contained in its constitution and statutes and in the constitution and statutes of the United States. The state of California itself recognizes the validities of the laws of the United States of America and it adopts those laws as its own. A qualifying feature of a court of record is that the tribunal is independent of the magistrate appointed to conduct the proceedings. The magistrate is a person appointed or elected to perform ministerial service in a court of record. His service is ministerial. And listen, you're welcome to use all of this uh, stuff in your own lawsuits when you're establishing your sovereignty and you're writing your judgments or rulings or whatever. This is powerful stuff. I want to... Hmm? Did you ever correct us that I have trouble getting into this section? You have trouble getting into this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the disc or on the website? I didn't know there was a problem. I'll go check it out. Okay. All right. In this instant, 
question, the magistrate unduly chose. Unduly. What does the word duly mean? Duly means it meets the requirements of both the common law and the statutory law. Or put another way, it meets the requirements of both sub substantive requirements and form requirements. That's, so we're saying he was unduly, meaning he didn't meet all the requirements. Okay? So, uh, where am I here? <clears throat> I lost it. Oh, there. In this instant question, the magistrate unduly chose to personally bypass all procedure, direct the court deputy clerk to reject the First Amendment action, and then sign the accompanying preprinted order without proper hearing or notice to any of the affected parties. That exceeds the jurisdiction of a magistrate who only possesses ministerial authority, separate from the authority of an independent tribunal of a court of record. On more than one occasion, the magistrate, you're going to love this, has indicated his preference for California rules. So be it for his cause. This court, for purposes of accommodating the accused choice of law, adopts the California Code of Civil Procedure as it relates to contempt of court. Let there be no doubt as to the justice of this proceeding for the accused. <laughs> you see what happened? The king said, suspend this law, bring this law in, and now it's a go. So you brought his law in? The king brought in the choice of law that the defendant, the accused, made. The judge over and over and over again cited California law. It was his preference. Even 1209. Even 1209. Let's go right here. On more than one occasion, the magistrate has indicated his preference for California rules. I'm going to click on that. Note 34, Plaintiff's Exhibit 15, page 4, line 17, 18, page 5, line 17, 19, and transcript, October 14th, page 4. We've nailed him. Okay? Isn't that, isn't that cute? Again, get this through your head. You are the boss. What you say is law. You decree the law. But only if you're the plaintiff. Only if you're the counter plaintiff. You cannot do any of this if you are the defendant. Okay? You've got to flip your status out of defendant status into plaintiff status. And you do that with a counterclaim or you do that with a habeas corpus. Alright? That's the key. It's your court. You de and a court of record is the form specified by the California Constitution. Hands down. It doesn't say maybe. It says they are courts of record. Okay? Alright. So... <clears throat> California Code of Civil Procedure, Section 1209, provides that acts in respect to a court's proceedings are contempts of the authority of the court. If a person who is appointed or elected to perform a ministerial service misbehaves, neglects, or violates a duty, or if a person falsely pretends to act under authority of an order or process of the court, or if a person disobeys any lawful judgment, order, or process of the court. Now remember, we had an order saying that the plaintiff could file a new amended action. Yes, sir. If you filed a uh, uh, dismiss um, uh, order to dismiss mm -hmm. are, as a defendant, how does this come in play? Well, repeat, all right. Now that order that that order that you that order that you you are defendant. Yeah, we'll repeat the question. That order that you're asking about, right? If you are a defendant and you're issuing an order to have that case dismissed. That's okay, provided that in the body of it, you assert your status as sovereign outside the jurisdiction and that this is an order from your court to their court. If you do that, then it's okay to order it as a defendant. Okay? Make sense? Or did I go too fast? Okay, one more time. <clears throat> if you are a defendant, and you issue an order to have the case dismissed against you, you must assert in the body of your order who you are. 
that you're sovereign relative to the state, that they have no jurisdiction over you, that this is an order from your court to their court. Okay? That's what's going to protect you. And one more thing. You want to accompany with it an order to show cause. Tell me why I'm wrong. And if they fail to answer that order to show cause, it means you're right. And you don't just tell them to file an order to show cause. You give them a deadline. When are they going to file it? You tell them when you want that order and if, uh, that response. If they don't respond, it's locked in. And you give them time. You know, They won't answer it, apparently. I've never had one answered. They need to show cause. I don't know why. Can it be in the body of the text? That's what I just said. Okay. Yeah, it has to be in the body. There's nowhere else you can put it. We have anything to say, say a microphone, please. Does it have to be in the body of the text, he says. <laughs> yes, of course it has to be in the body of the text. That's what I said. If you back up the tape, or the DVD, you'll see that's what, what I said. Okay. So, uh, we say, <clears throat> or if a person disobeys any lawful judgment, order, or process of the court, engages in any other unlawful interference with the process or proceedings of a court, or if an inferior magistrate interferes with the lawful judgment, order, or process of a superior court, or proceeding in an action or special proceeding contrary to law after such action or special proceeding is removed from the jurisdiction of such inferior magistrate. See, it was removed from his jurisdiction, wasn't it, when we had a prior order. So that magistrate was kind of uh, in the wrong position. As the magistrate pointed out, CCP section 1209 in no manner allows for a court to hold itself in contempt. That is true. But that is not the issue before this court. The issue is whether or not the accused persons are to be held in contempt. The magistrate holds only ministerial authority. He holds no tribunal authority and cannot in any way substitute himself as the total equivalent of the court to thus exempt himself from jurisdiction. CCP 1209 provides that contempt may be applied to misbehavior in office or other willful neglect or violation of duty by an attorney, counsel, clerk, sheriff, coroner, or other person appointed or elected to perform a judicial or ministerial service. The magistrate is an other, quote, other person appointed or elected to perform ministerial service, as described in CCP section 1209. Depriving anyone of the right to have his day in court is very serious. The magistrate has a duty to the plaintiff to minister the opportunity to argue the petition put forth by the deputy clerk. He who, here's a quote, very important quote. You ought, you ought to keep this one in mind for future writing. He who decides a case with the other side unheard, though he decide justly, is himself unjust. Okay? And who said that? That was by Seneca. An ancient authority. I think, wasn't he uh, one of the heads of Greece, of Athens? <coughs> Philosopher, highly respected. So, anybody... So, he, he is himself unjust. To summarily remove a first amended action that has been previously sanctioned by the court constitutes a direct challenge to the court's authority, especially when the magistrate's judicial jurisdiction is a stop and he tacitly declines a fair opportunity to show cause why he should not be subject to estoppel. California Code of Civil Procedure provides that when the contempt is not committed in the immediate view and presence of the court or of the judge at chambers, an affidavit shall be presented to the court or judge of the facts constituting the contempt. In this instance, an affidavit of the facts constituting the contempt was presented to this court and not to a judge. Notice that, by the way, this is a quote out of the code, okay, that the uh, affidavit has to be presented. An affidavit shall be presented. Notice what it says, to the court or judge. Okay? See, they recognize what a court is and what a judge is. They're two different animals. Okay? Again, what's a court? The person and suit of the sovereign. Who's the sovereign? That's right. You are. Okay. So, um, in this instance, an affidavit was presented. Okay. There was no opposing affidavit. California Code of Civil Procedure 1211.5 provides, if no objection is made to the sufficiency of such affidavit or statement during the hearing on the charges contained therein, 
jurisdiction of the subject matter shall not depend on the averments of each affidavit or statement, but may be established by the facts found by the trial court to have been proved at such hearings. Okay? Normally, had he objected, then you would have had some issues. But since he didn't object, the court can move on. It now has jurisdiction. Okay? Failure to object means you agree. Same old principle. Okay? Impeachment and penalty. The court, having reviewed the facts and the record, finds that I hold the filings as a judge not guilty of contempt of this court. And Roy Legume is a judge guilty of contempt of this court. And Roy Legume shall pay a fine of one dollar within sixty days of entry of this ruling. <laughs> if the fine is not timely paid, or if this court in the future should otherwise see the need, this court shall forward appropriate notice and a copy of all transcripts and papers in this matter to the California Council on Judicial Performance. And attorneys' fees and costs awarded to William Jones, none asked and none awarded. Execution of this order shall be stayed pending the filing within six judicial days of a petition for extraordinary relief testing the lawfulness of this court's order or a notice of intent to file within 30 days a motion for reconsideration. Now, that little phrase there was put in because when the, a court in California finds an attorney in contempt, he gets that privilege. So what we did, even though there was no specific code to that effect, we did the same thing for the judge. Again, what are we doing? We're showing we're fair, we're considerate, every opportunity is being extended. He never did it. Okay? Did he pay the dollar? No. No. What happened was he was pulled off of our case by the presiding judge. What is the purpose of contempt? Two purposes. One, preserve the dignity of the court. To preserve the authority of the court. When he was removed, that was gone. There was no need to enforce anything. We had a new judge come in. We looked up the dossier of the new judge, or what they call a profile. The law library has profiles of all judges. So we looked up the profile, and the profiles on this new judge said that he was a member of a private group of judges that studied the common law. He was a specialist. I'll tell you what else it said about him. This was a superior court. Now, the superior court has an appellate division, and the appellate division uh, hears appeals from the municipal court. If you lose in a municipal court, you can appeal either to a regular appellate court or you can appeal to the superior court appellate division. Now, the appellate division of the superior court is a very, very high quality court. The guys that are in that, that staff that, are very sharp, very experienced, very knowledgeable. And these guys in the appellate division of the Superior Court, when they write an opinion, it has precedent value just like an appellate decision does. Okay? So we're not talking about schlocks here. We're talking about guys who know what they're doing. This man that they assigned to our court was their big gun. He used to be the presiding judge of the appellate division. Okay, so he was a specialist in common law. He was a sharp on other laws. But so we decided, all right, we'd let him in because it'd be nice to deal with somebody who's knowledgeable. And he was knowledgeable. So anyway, that was that was the uh, contempt ruling. And that contempt ruling <coughs> will be extremely valuable to you when you write your own decisions because. The entire chain of logic is there that leads from the Constitution right down to the court level as to why you're boss and they are not. Okay, that's what makes that useful. I go back, I forget stuff, and I go back and I'm pulling stuff out of there all the time for other decisions, other, other orders that I do. So I highly, highly suggest that you, you study that one because it, it pounded the judge into the ground. Uh, it, it, he lost his job over it. They pulled him off of that in 900 other cases. <laughs> no, no. Uh, sorry, sorry. He didn't actually lose his job. He got assigned to Timbuktu. Some little That's tiny, you know, he was not in that main court anymore. They put him off in some jurisdiction. I don't know where, but it was it was same county, but a little tiny town. Okay? Yes. How is the new judge doing? The new one. Oh, he was educated. Like I said, it was easier to deal with. 
Now, he still tried, you know, he, he didn't really read the case thoroughly, but uh, we, we um, I think we did issue some orders against him correcting him. I didn't publish them here because it doesn't add anything. It's the same old stuff. Just waste your time, you know. You, you, what you've got is complete. This is a good model to learn from. <coughs> and uh, so, if you learn by experience, well, like one guy said to me, he was really upset me. He says, I want to see another example. I said, well, you don't understand the first one. How are you going to understand the second one? Okay? Because he wouldn't do the homework. He wouldn't read it. And I could tell by the questions he asked, he never even read it. So, this, so I just, you know, I just blew him off. and just said, well, you know, and then that really upset him. I didn't care and so on. But, you know, that's the way it goes. But anyhow, no, seriously, this, everything, I found it over and over again, I found it useful for other things. And it's interesting, we've never had a single order to show cause responded to. Isn't that amazing? You'd think they'd say something, even if they were wrong. Okay, well, you want a break or something? Yeah. We haven't had dinner, have we? <coughs> Seven. So, has this case been completed? No. I have yet to write the final judgment. That's next. The case has not been completed. Okay, well, we've had a break here. Any questions? Yes. Over here. Any questions before the microphone? All right. Could you clarify when you use the um, master and when you're? Um, now I forgot the rest of the part. When, when you're when you're there as the master versus when you're there as the sovereign. Well, when you're a sovereign of your own court, you're always a sovereign. You're never the master. Okay? You're never the judge. You are in your own capacity as the sovereign of the court. And if, you, and, and if your court makes a decision, you're the highest authority, it's not appealable. Okay? So when would you be the master? You're never the master of your own court. You're oh, never. I thought in the earlier part this morning there was a time when we that were the That was somebody ma- else's court that I okay. was master in. Okay, thank you. See, a master... Uh, look, you're the sovereign of the court. You're the do-all and be-all of the court, okay? And, and between you and your sovereign capacity and your suit, between those two, you now have created the court, the artificial entity called the court. And now, just imagine... A lot of these ans- questions about courts can be answered by setting your mind back to the 15th century. And just imagine that you're the king of the realm. And, and if you are the king with one subject, you have a relationship, right? You own the subject. Well, as you grow in activity, you start hiring people to manage your affairs. And finally you get so big, you, you peel off the court system, you make it a separate court system, you hire the judge and you tell the judge, you're my mirror. You have to do things the way I want it to be done. I'm the lawgiver and you are the administrator. And so you, you, uh, you hire people, in effect, to carry on various tasks. And so that's what it is here. Now here in the United States, You are sovereigns without subjects. But that's not strictly true because people become your subjects when you hire them. Okay? It may be just a conditional type of thing. And who are your subjects? Well, you have the the, uh, judge of the court. You have the clerk of the court. You have the... um, Who is it? The, um, The court recorder. You have the marshal. All of these people are in your court. They're in your jurisdiction when you're running your case for that moment. And, uh, 
the uh, your chief warehouseman for your paperwork is called the clerk of the court, and, and they'll warehouse your papers forever. <laughs> okay, at a very reasonable price when you think about it. What would it cost you to set up a deal like that and make sure whatever papers you had were always available to everybody? So, uh, in the case in the case where I was uh, a special master, that was because. The sovereign himself couldn't do it because he was in jail. Okay? He was too busy, wasn't he? So, he appointed me as a special master in his court in the same sense that a judge would be appointed. Only thing is, I didn't get paid. Okay? But that's what it was. I, I was just, uh, I was just uh, taking over a function that the, the sovereign was too busy to do himself. He can be his own clerk if necessary. But there are certain advantages. I mean, heck, a couple hundred bucks, whatever they charge for it, and you get the entire staff available to you. You get the judge, the clerk, the marshals, enforcement, you know. That's literally true. Okay. Any other questions? Next question. Okay. Well, I guess I... I guess... Say again? How do you shut down the court in five minutes? How do you shut down the court? No, the, the hearing. How, the hearing. <clears throat> how is it that you, you get the hearing to only last five minutes? Well, it's because what, whatever the hearing is, no matter what it is, you've done all your talking on paper. There's nothing to talk about. Okay? So, the only thing is, is that they might do things. For example, a very typical thing that happens is that uh, the opposing attorney will start offering information to the judge. Information that was never in the paperwork. Well, that's not legit. The whole purpose of a court hearing is to give the court an opportunity to clarify something you wrote. If In one case, somebody told me that there's a court that, that he's going to, the judge won't even let him talk, won't, won't let him have a hearing. And I'm telling him, that's right. He doesn't have to because he has no questions to ask you. Okay? You said everything you're going to say in your paper and that's it. All right, now the judge, if the judge or the court is confused about something, needs more information, call you in, ask you, query you, but he cannot give any new information. He can argue the case based on the existing, existing information that was submitted in the paperwork. See, the normal timing, and I discussed this in the, uh, in, in the last seminar dealing with motions, that in your normal timing is, is you make a motion and there's a hearing is set 30 days after you make the motion. And then the other person has 20 days to answer. So he, 20 days later, he comes through with your answer. You now have five days to reply to his answer. That leaves five days for the judge to read it, to get out, read all the information. They have, right, they have to have it filed. So that, that's kind of the timing. He files the motion, 20 days to answer, five days to reply, and then five days so the judge, for the judge to read it. And then you have the hearing. So that, that's your sequence. Now, you make all your arguments, whatever you're going to say. Well, he, if, whoever made the motion first, he says what he's going to say. In the reply, or in the answer to the motion, you say whatever you're going to say. But you deal with the motion. You don't deal with other issues. So there's kind of a restriction on it. If you put other stuff in, if you wander all over the conversational map, well, a lot of your stuff will be thrown out because it's not related to the subject at hand, the motion. And then, when the other party replies to the answer, the reply is restricted to the, the issues that are there. Can't bring in any more facts. Why? Because there's no follow-up paper that will allow him to argue against whatever new information you bring in. So you can't bring in new information. Then when you show up at the hearing, the only purpose of the hearing is that, you know, I've read all the discussion, read those three papers, you know, motion, answer, reply. Judges read all three. 
confused about something, this is an opportunity to ask questions. If he doesn't ask any answer, if he doesn't ask any questions, well, that's it. Decisions next. Go ahead. Uh, I was I was in an arraignment court um, about a month ago, and um, the the complaint and the dec declaration were not, was not signed by anyone, and I pointed this out. Mm -hmm. And so then the prosecutor got a, uh, the judge gave the prosecutor the piece of paper. Right. I mean the co commissioner. And, he signed it. and no, and then he marched it over to the to the deputy DA. Right. And she signed it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How, how can they, they're not? They can't be an injured party. How can I mean? How can they do this? How, there's no way. This well, is they, they, this is three years saying, old. They're representing the state. 